Good morning. Good morning. I know we're not at full capacity yet, but uh, that's still better. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Father's Day. So we're glad that all the fathers are here. So um, I have a prayer for our father. So I'd like to share this, unless I get into the service and uh, forget I didn't put it anywhere in the bulletin. So uh, let us join in a prayer for our fathers. Heavenly Father, you entrusted your son Jesus, the child of Mary, to the care of Joseph, an earthly father. Bless all fathers as they care for their families. Give them strength and wisdom, tenderness and patience. Support them in the work they have to do, protecting those who look to them as we look to you for love and salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our rock and defender, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's spend a few moments looking at the... Uh, announcements and uh, on Wednesday a couple of things on Wednesday we have uh, a food distribution at Parkview Tires you can uh, if you're able to help you can get a hold of Becky Levita and uh, I sent an email I think to those who are on council if you can help with that and um, council meeting will be at 6 p.m. now we usually meet in the library but so we can spread out a little bit I guess the word of the day is social distancing. Uh, we'll meet in the fellowship hall. So unless you have the code to get in, you know, in that door there, that door will be locked. So just come straight to the fellowship hall. If you have the code, you want to come in that way, fine. But if you don't, come into the, uh, the fellowship hall. Okay, uh, what else do we have going on? Oh, we have the homeless lunch prep. Uh, they are uh, have restarted their ministry. The recovery group is also, I've asked each group to give me a plan, and I'm not asking for like a 10-page plan, just a basic thing, so what you're going to do, uh, you know, just spread out and wear a mask if you're close together, have hand sanitizer, wipe down the tables when you're done, that kind of thing. So right now we have the homeless lunch, uh, homeless lunch uh, people are back, and we also have uh, the recoveries coming back. And uh, at this point, it's up to whatever group and, and you know, as what their plan is to come back. But they're welcome to come back with their protocols in place. And the scouts are coming back, I believe the troop at least is, in uh, July. So what else? Uh, John Wesley's birthday, is that? When is that? That's next week, right? I think he'll be 300 and something. So. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it's almost July, so Independence Day. That's... Uh, the announcement I have for today, does anybody have any other announcements that you would like to share? If there are none, let us begin our worship service with our opening prayer, and then right after that, we will join together in our call to worship. So if you'd please uh, stand together. We gather today as fellow travelers. Some of us are on the mountaintops of life celebrating milestones. Some of us are traveling the deepest and darkest of valleys, but we gather together today, regardless of where we are on our journey, seeking the same thing, God's presence. Lord, we gather seeking you on our journeys. Be with us today in this worship in a way that gives us hope for the future. Amen. It's a unison call to worship, so please join me in this. God of all power, you called from death our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. Send us as shepherds to rescue the lost, to heal the injured, and to feed one another with knowledge and understanding through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, we're going to join in worship today. Um, if you feel more comfortable sitting, uh, please uh, feel, feel free to sit. If you feel more comfortable standing, that's all good. Um, we're still encouraging people not to sing along, but to meditate on the words that we are uh, that we are bringing to God, and uh, almost uh, focusing on them as a, a prayer together. Please join us. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, you may need the same old voice tell the same old
She'll be on IV antibiotics for two weeks. Um, keep praying for her. Uh, she's in a lot of pain. Her uh, uh, 
Uh, there's been some complications. Her shoulder is really hurt from a uh, pick line mishap. She's had some issues there. And then immediately after uh, I was driving home from the hospital with Cassie, my dad calls me and says, he, says that he guesses that the Collins is supposed to be in the hospital because my mom went into McGee's ER the same day that Cassie left with a uh, uh, infection in her uh, her bad arm. She has, a, she has lymphedema in her bad arm. And uh, ended up staying in the same room that Cassie stayed in. <laughs> so, oh, <geez. laughs> so, yeah, keep us in your prayers. <laughs> Thanks, Bo. We can definitely keep Cassie and your mom in, in our prayers. Mm -hmm. um, we also uh, want to keep in prayers for, uh, these are ones that were mentioned in the last couple weeks, uh, Karen Crowder, uh, sister-in-law Pat, uh, she recovers from knee surgery. Uh, Ethan Webb uh, had surgery on his throat, who was confined to the couch for two weeks. I think he's now starting his second week. <coughs> so we want to pray for him. And uh, Linda Abraham is a Got a frog in my throat, as I said. It was. Um, prayers for uh, Glenda as she recovers from hip replacement. We want to continue to pray for the impact of COVID 19, as well as all the social unrest and everything that has been happening. So we want to keep all these things before us um, in prayer. Does anyone have any other prayer uh, requests today? Go ahead, Alex. I just want to. Intruder, if you didn't hear, Intruder was at her son, your son and daughter-in-law's house in their bedroom, and nothing became of it. And so praise, uh, praise God for that. Good thing it didn't happen to me, because they probably would be alive. Okay. Um, anything else today? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we know that this is a, a difficult time at so many different levels. We know that we are in, in a valley, um, as your psalm says, but the, you also promise that you get us through the valleys and you walk with us. As we heard today, we know from a, a very personal levels, everything from an intruder to um, those who are recovering from surgeries. We also pray for the racial and social unrest for that is affecting our country. And we pray for the continued effects of economic, emotional, spiritual, of uh, the coronavirus, Lord. We pray for that as a ongoing prayers. And uh, we pray that you would touch everybody uh, who feels this, Lord, with your your presence of your Holy Spirit, Lord, and to lift them and to know that even though that many in many ways the wrong seems off so strong, that God is the ruler yet. And 
And so we lift these prayers before you. And we know that you are hearing our prayers. And not only hear, but you do respond. And we remember the prayer that Jesus taught to his disciples that we lift up this day as our prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. This is the word of God, for we who are the people of God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as we come to the time of message, Lord, we know that you are the one who is our Father Shepherd. I pray that with the help of your Holy Spirit that you would help me to say your words. I ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the first century B.C., or maybe even centuries after that, that much of the world was unknown, right? Uncharted territory unexplored, and it was largely unmapped. So map makers, they needed a way to portray these uncharted territories that had, they had no idea what was there. So what they did is they symbolized, you ever look at these old-timey maps? So they symbolized these regions by portraying images of dragons, monsters, you know, large fish, or octopi. And the message was clear. Uncharted and unexplored places were fearsome and terrible places, and it was best not to go there. Right? That was the message. Uh, terrors lay buried there, but as many maps also declared, there are treasures there as well. So it's kind of like the message was, you don't want to go here, but there might be something good in those areas, too, that we don't know about. That's what propelled all the explorers, right? Uh, coming to the New World and trying to find their way to India and things like that. They had no idea where they were going. They just thought their possibility, maybe it's a little bit frightening, but there was some, maybe they'd find something good there. There's a story about a battalion of Roman soldiers that was in battle and they, they went into such a place, you know, they crossed into uncharted territory, and the commander sent a message back to Rome asking for instructions, and he said, because they have marched off the map. In the 1950s, there was a famous sermon by a Methodist uh, preacher by the name of Halford Lucock. He was a uh, professor also at Yale, and uh, what he did in that message, he quoted Walt Whitman, and Walt Whitman, the great poet, said this. He said, listen, I will be honest with you. I do not offer you old, smooth prizes, but I offer you new, rough prizes. And while that message was true then, I believe that it is even more true for us today, isn't it? Think about, as we talked about and prayed about during our prayer time, all of the problems, I don't even have to list them. List, uh, list them. You know what they are, right? All the social unrest, the virus, everything that's going on in the world. Uh, China is a, uh, basically an enemy country that undermines us at every turn. We have internal problems, external problems. There's problems, problems everywhere, right? But the message that came from that sermon of Walt Whitman was what? Um, God has a way of giving us new prizes that emerge. Maybe we're used to like the old smooth prizes, but there are rough prizes and things that God will still give us. God has not stopped working, right? I'll tell you so just a little story I saw on one of the news channels, don't even remember which one it was the other day. There was a diner in New York City that was shut down because of the pandemic. And, you know, shut down for week after week after week. And when they, so they came up and with the guidelines, they reopened. But they didn't reopen as an inside diner. They reopened as a drive-in, like a drive-in theater showing old movies. So the, the, the segment I was watching, they were showing Ferris Bueller's Day, Day Off. Everyone remember that, you know? Uh, that's a classic uh, movie, right? And so they're showing that, and people have never seen it before. They, and some of the people who were there were never in in a drive-in before, right? This is New York City. Never been to a drive-in before. Um, so they are selling this out. Like they're bring, having the drive-in shown in an old movie. They were, you know, bringing food to the cars with like 
like uh, they used to do on roller skates and that kind of stuff. Um, and they are selling out every event that they have. They can't even, they're booked so far ahead, like their, their, their tickets, they have to put out tickets now, and they're going on sale places like um, those stuff hub and you know, those types of places because they sell out instantly as soon as they're available. And so I thought, wow, that's what Walt Whitman is talking about, isn't he? It's like, sometimes God, we're used to the old smooth treasures that God gives us, like what we've had before and how it worked. But sometimes God says, uh-uh, now, now I'm going to give you something that's a little bit rougher. I'm going to give you a prize, but it's going to be different, right? So that's what this theater, this uh, diner did. They turned something that was negative he said, we never had this amount of popularity before. Um, it's just like in the church. We're learning how to do video stuff. Now, we're in a transitional period because uh, we're grateful for Bo, who's been bringing in his camera, and we're recording it, and it's going up online later. But our goal with is we got some new equipment. Kathy and I are trying to, mostly Kathy, and I, I don't want to take the credit, I'm trying to learn it, and I hope to learn it too, and I, I brought Bo into the picture. Like, our goal is to live stream it, right? So we can get it out there right at 10 a.m. So if someone's not here, they can see it. We're working on that. But the thing is, would we have been doing any of this if this, all this uh, pandemic stuff wouldn't have happened? No. So we're used to the old smooth prices, but sometimes God wants to do something new and to get uh, things out in a different way. And it takes time and effort and to do it. But it's not a smooth prize, but it's a rough prize that God... Uh, presents to us. So how can we possibly hope to navigate through all of these uncharted territories and realms that we're in now? Um, I'm just going back to an old thing. Psalm 23. Isn't Psalm 23? I think it has to be one of the, if not the most known Bible chapter, has to be one of the most known. Maybe the Lord's Prayer is actually in, the, in Scripture and in the Gospel of Luke also. But uh, it's often called, Psalm 23, the six longest short verses in the Bible. So I want to turn to this very well-known psalm to talk about this. The power of Psalm 23 is it comes from its use of two key words that appear in verse 4. And I want to uh, quote verse 4 again. Yea, well, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So the two key words that appear in verse 4 are what? Though and through. The same words, except for a single letter R, right? Exactly the same words. One has an R in it, the other doesn't. But just one little letter makes all the difference between low and through. But they're key uh, words in this uh, verse. David, the innocent shepherd boy, he knew the truth behind the first word. Love. Right? You ever think about that word, love? What does it mean? Well, it doesn't mean if. It means though means you are in it, right? You don't have a choice. You're in it. You're in the valley. No, you are in the valley. Not if you are in the valley. Lo, you are in the valley. There are dangers lurking around every corner. There was no if about the reality of life's obstacles and problems. If you live, you're going to have problems and you're going to have obstacles. That is what life is. Psalm 23 Faces reality. It says, not if, but lo, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Life isn't all loaded tables, overflowing cups, or green pastures. Sometimes our hair, or I guess my head in my case, isn't anointed, feel like it's anointed with oil, it feels sometimes like it's more grind with dirty grease. Sometimes we're not lying in green pastures, but we're frailing around in blue Mondays. Sometimes we're not resting by the shore of still waters, but we're struggling in the valley of the shadow. 
Every one of us has a valley. Some of us have a valley that we've been given at birth. A valley of poverty, abuse, disability. Some of us are born into green pastures of plenty, and we immediately begin to dig our own dark valleys through drugs, alcohol, violence, ignorance, prejudice. So there's two ways you get in the valley. Sometimes you, you don't control it. You're just in the valley, right? Who thought in December 2019 we'd have this kind of year in 2020? So sometimes you're just in the valley, and sometimes you dig the valley yourself. But the psalmist, he describes this, this person who digs their own. That case, in Psalm 59, verse 6, he says, they dig the pit into the midst whereof they have fallen themselves. So there are different ways that we can get in the valley. Sometimes we don't have control over it, and sometimes we make valleys ourselves. But while we were walking, right, when we're in the valley, does it say to walk, stand still, or run? We walk, right? Now, I was thinking about this. Some, sometimes folks want to get out of something by putting the, the pedal to the metal, right? That's our temptation. We just want to get, you know, when are you reopening church, Pastor? When are we going to, you know, we want to, when's everything going to open? When's everything going to get back to normal? Sometimes we want to put the pedal to the metal. Remember, I talked about cars last week and how my daughter thought that I drove 40s and 50 cars, not 70s cars. Um, I don't know how old she thinks I am, but, um, but, you know, remember back in the 70s, and what kind of cars were there? There weren't four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive cars and SUVs. Most cars were sedans, and what kind of drive did they have? Rear-wheel drive, right? And you had to go out and get snow tires. And now most of us, I don't know about you, but I just run all season all year round. You had to get, you know, go to the gas station or wherever, get snow tires, because when gas stations actually did repairs. Uh, you had to have the snow tires put on. And sometimes when it really got bad, you had to get chains or, you know, maybe studs. And then in the spring, there was always a date that you had to remove your studs from the car. Remember that? Off, off your tires. And, uh, and how many times have you lived around the hills and valleys of Pittsburgh that you would hear this noise on a winter morning? And so the person thought the more they gassed it, the more they're going to get out of it, right? But you have to be prepared. You have to have the tread or, you know, put some change in, you know, get the sand out of the trunk or whatever and get some traction. Um, so you can't just, you have to... To get, if you're stuck, you have to get yourself out of it slowly. It's going to be a process. It's going to be a process. It's not going to be instantly. You know, I said to folks, it's just like every church getting back up to some churches are not doing live worship yet. Many of them are not. Uh, some aren't doing it until some, some point in July. Or some churches don't even do it until next year. Right? Um, but it's going to be a process. We're not going to run out of this. We're, you know, we're not going to put the metal to the floor and expect to get it's going to be it's going to be like one step at a time so and that's what this psalm 23 says it says we walk through the valley of the shadows we are taught that god is with us and that god bears all the sufferings and pains of the world and uh the hurts of our scarred and our sacred souls god is with us in whatever we face in life for us as Christians, the cross becomes the symbol of the agony of both creation and the creator. Though, there's that word again, though none of us gets out of life without walking the valley, the psalmist makes it plain that God does not intend for us to be in the valley forever. He doesn't say run out of it, but he doesn't say stand still in it. The valley of the shadow is something that one, what, goes through. Valleys are not resting places, but they are through ways. We can walk through our problems. We can walk through our sorrows. We can walk through our pain. We can walk through our screw-ups. What Psalm 23 promises us is that in all of these journeys, the Lord will walk with us.
He'll walk with us and take our hand. But he says, hey, if you're going to take his hand, what he doesn't want you to do is try to pull him along and lead him. And the other thing he doesn't want you to do is just stand still. He's side by side walking with us. Though and through differ by what letter? One small R. Did you know that in American Sign Language, anyone know American Sign Language? Good, because if I get this wrong, you can't correct me. In American Sign Language, R is made by crossing the middle finger over the index finger, I think like this. But cross fingers have a history of sign language that predates American Sign Language. In fact, in the first centuries of the church, there they had the church was under tremendous persecution, so there were certain symbols that you used. One of them was the sign of the fish, because remember, uh, who did Jesus call first as his uh, disciples? Peter, James, and John, who were fishermen. So, you know, Jesus spent a lot of time talking about fish, being with fishermen. Jesus was kind of a fishy kind of guy, right? He, first thing he said is go out and fish for people, you know? Um, so the fish was a symbol. The other, the other symbol was the cross, uh, by crossing your fingers. Um, because Christians were persecuted, believers found ways to communicate their faith in these subtle ways. Accompanying a greeting or farewell, cross fingers were a code sign. Like if you were talking to someone, that would be a code sign identifying Christians to one another that you were a person of the cross or people of the cross. The cross fingers were a solid symbol for the cross of Christ and the redemption of Christ's death on the cross that was brought to all people. Today, cross fingers can mean a couple of other things. Like different things change meanings, and unfortunately, cross fingers is one of those things. It's just like the word hope. Hope is a very biblical word meant you're sure it's going to happen. Now it means, well, you know, I hope it doesn't rain today because we have a picnic. You know. But biblically, hope is not the way we use that word in our language, uh, normal language today. But cross fingers, they mean a couple things. Uh, first of all, they translate it into luck, right? Luck that everything will go your way. You cross your fingers. Or if you do it behind your back, what does that mean? It means that you're really not saying what you mean. Uh, so you can do that. And then if you hold your cross fingers in your lap, that means that you're hoping something will or will not come to pass and happen. Some of you uh, may remember uh, September 8th, 1994. This predates a lot of our other tragedies, 9-11 and everything else. Anyone remember what happened in September 1994 on Pittsburgh? Well, good, I can tell you. What? Exactly. See, we have our idle ringer out there. Yeah, flight uh, 427 in Hopewell Township crashed uh, with uh, 132 passengers on board. And um, Rush Chido, who was the director of emergency services for Beaver County, he was the person in charge of picking up body parts with no human faces on them. Chido confessed to the, the uh, sight that affected him the most. He said this, the thing I'm not going to be able to forget for a long time is finding a hand with its fingers crossed as if, as if for luck. It was the Christians who invented the cross fingers. And believe me, folks, it has nothing to do, the cross has nothing to do with luck. I, I've learned that, and I try to avoid it, the term good luck. Because that is so outside of Christian beliefs. If someone's leaving, you know, you're, like you're leaving a job, you know how that is, you're going off somewhere, you say what? We say good luck. We shouldn't say good luck. You know what we should say is that God speak. It's an old word, but I think it's more appropriate for believers. It says, what does God speak mean? It means God, God go with you. Or you can simply say God go with you. I love to study language and I pull up archaic words and start using them. Uh, but that's a great word, right? Godspeed. It's a much better word than good luck. So it was the Christians who, who invented this word. It has nothing to do, uh, cross fingers have nothing to do with luck. And this is what the cross fingers of the little r 
the difference that turns a though into a through still mean to the believer? This day, though we walk in whatever way, whether it's at our country, in society, individual, even though we walk in the darkness of the shadow, remember that, are we alone? No. For one thing, we're with each other. That, that's what Christianity is, how it distinguishes itself from many other faiths, because it's a, it's a community faith. It means that you can't really be a Christian by yourself. Um, it's meant to be a community faith. So even though we walk, we don't walk alone because we walk with each other. Remember uh, the two great commands are to love your neighbor, and the one that, priest, uh, that is in front of that is what? To love God. So who else is with us? Jesus is with us also. So when we walk through the valley, we're not alone in this. We're with others, and we're also with our Lord. God is with us. Walking through the valley with us is the one who suffered and died for our sake. He is the crucified one. So when I reflect on Psalm 23, I think that the reason it is used uh, so much everywhere because those words that the Lord gives us are timeless, that even though we walk through the valley, the Lord is with us, and others are with us also. Amen. So we're going to close with uh, the hymn that, uh, Oh God, our help in ages past, and God is our help today also. Thank you.